Well, it was always 5'7", but I may have shrunk over time, too, <laughs> so you never know. So right. between the five of us, we got a couple of guards, a couple of forwards. We got our center in the middle. We're we ready. can't jump. Let's... <laughs> I, yeah, can't, I, I met Minute Bowl once, and it was oh, I mean, as tall as I am. I don't run into people that taller than tall. me or that much. I mean, it was really disconcerting to stand yeah. next to somebody who's yeah. a foot taller than me. <laughs> who's tall? Uh, Patrick, when you were ref in tennis matches, who was the tallest player on the circuit? Well, that's a good question. Uh, well, I remember Roscoe Tanner. I, I don't yeah. know how tall he was, but he was pretty tall. Mm -hmm. Yannick Noah was very tall. Lendl was pretty tall. Uh, how about on the women's side? Back when tennis was amazing. Still is, but God, it was great back then. You know, Mar Martina Navratilova, I'm trying to remember her height. Uh, Gabriel Horvath. Mm -hmm. uh, Gabby, uh, uh, I'm sorry, not the the woman from, I think she was from Brazil. Gabby. Uh, I know who you mean. Sabatini? You know who I'm talking about. Sabatini. Uh, was it... Gabriel Sabatini. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah very good. Very good job. So she was she was fairly tall. Uh, actually, the woman from Pennsylvania who played doubles, uh, Pam Shriver. Oh boy, yeah, Shriver. She was pretty tall. Yeah, we're doing pretty good. We filming are. the place. Yes, yes. Right? Uh... What? What a good thing. It's a tennis crowd. That? It's a tennis most crowd. Definitely. Yeah. All right, most foul-mouthed player you ever <laughs> dealt with as a ref could really bring it. I'll tell you why. Uh, at the beginning of his career, Andre Agassi was the worst. And he used to go after everyone, players, umpires, uh, people in the stands. It was terrible. As he got older, though, he really relaxed a lot more, and he was much different on the court. So I think he was he was one. I'll tell you what, you know what, a real potty mouth. That was Jimmy Connors. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, Jimmy Connors, I tell you, he would lose it on the court. And, you know, obviously McEnroe would have his tirades. That's uh, very, very well known. Uh, but, you know, look, th there were some really wild matches. I once got booed out of a stadium in Stratton Mountain, Vermont, because both players were going crazy. I think it was uh, Ned Caswell, Leonardo Lavalier, if I'm remembering this right, where it was this wild match uh, going on, and uh, both players were going crazy. I, If I remember right, they were assessed point penalties and maybe even a, a game penalty uh, for against one of them. It's uh, just sometimes these guys just couldn't control themselves. And the most polite gentlemanly player, uh, male and female. Hmm. <laughs> no, there's a short <laughs> list there. Huh? And it's known as a rather genteel sport. <laughs> you can think of no one. General? Wait a minute. Um, <laughs> you know what? Uh, Matt Zelander. Oh, yeah. Was oh, yeah. Good. Uh, and then I, there used to be um, Kathy Rinaldi. I always liked her mm -hmm. on the women's side. I don't know if you guys remember her. Yep. Mm -hmm. I always liked Carling Bassett on the women's side. Yeah. Carling. Yeah, she was good very name. nice. Yeah. Well, I, well, I appreciate it. Mean, I'll be honest with yeah. you. Sometimes it was just some of the lower ranked players that you just never hear about but they were uh, a lot of really nice people of course and then there's some people that were just jerks but uh <laughs> it was a lot of fun you know you imagine you're you're 20 you're 21 years of age and you're traveling around and you know before that time i'd never really been much out of the state that i'm living in and here we are you know i'm going to boston and i'm going to illinois and i'm sleeping on a couches or or the floor uh, that you're just going out and umpiring tennis matches. They're not paying you very much, but you have a chance to get out on the professional men's tennis circuit and see a lot of different things. So mm -hmm. it was definitely a lot of fun as a young man. You don't get paid a lot, but at least you get berated, right? <laughs> well, there, well, look, you, you get out and about. You uh, you don't play that much, uh, and I used to play a lot when I was younger, but you get to travel and you get to see places. So I remember going to the U.S. Pro in Boston, I remember going to uh, the Philadelphia uh, tournament, and then uh, there were a couple of uh, challenger uh, sets uh, over in Illinois. I think there was the uh, uh, they had the Washington tournament at a tournament in Livingston, New Jersey, up in New York. I mean, it was just 
it was a lot of fun because you get to uh, learn uh, the ins and outs of the pro tennis circuit. And in 1988, if I remember right, I was on the road. It was the year I was finishing up college. And one of the ways I was trying to pay my way through was getting out on the men's tennis circuit for maybe 15 to 17 weeks all summer. And then during some of the, uh, the spring breaks and other times, I remember going to the Lipton International Tennis Tournament in Key Biscayne, Florida. It's the first time I was ever in Florida and uh, just wonderful. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, to be that up close and personal and see just how talented these men and women are. I mean, how hard yeah. they hit, how and accurate they are. Back when they, they were are. shot makers. Oh, yeah. Today it seems like it's whoever can just blow it by you right. the, the best, but the shot makers back well, then were amazing. You guys kind of remember that at the time, we're talking about some of the people, uh, I mean, obviously wooden rackets had kind of stopped mm -hmm. by the mid-'80s. Borg was the famous one mm -hmm. with yeah. the wooden racket. But, you know, I think at one point McEnroe used to have the uh, – the Max Ply Dun, uh, Dunlap mm -hmm. Sport, if I'm remembering oh, right. Yeah. Oh, yep. yeah. And so, uh, but you'd start to see the rackets move to the, you know, the headmaster and the head pro, and then ultimately to these Prince rackets that had the, the large heads, so it was much easier uh, mm -hmm. to play. And so that started to occur, if I remember right, probably back in the late 80s and 90s. And it's a completely different game now. Because uh, some of these rackets, I mean, they're they're powerful as heck. Uh, but back then, you know, you can look at some old matches. Like I, I saw some of the clips recently of McEnroe and Lendl from the French Open, and you just could see the kind of touch that these guys have. It was wild. Absolutely, they're, they were shot makers, like mm -hmm. we were saying, man. They could really yeah. place it. Uh, let's talk about uh, the 60-day legislative session, uh, Patrick. Any uh, takes you have from that recently concluded session? No, I mean, I think it was an election year, so uh, they, they tried to do some things that are positive. Uh, I will say this. I'm looking forward to the opportunity next year. If I'm fortunate enough to get elected governor, I'm going to try to get together with the House and with the Senate, uh, with the rank and file and the leadership, and try to put a common agenda together uh, that brings the governor's office, the House, and the Senate together, and then I really want to tackle the big problems and challenges facing West Virginia. I think there's so much time that we need to be putting into workforce participation issues and trying to make sure that we're filling a lot of the open jobs that are out there. And, you know, we need to do that a lot more than what we're seeing. Uh, so that's a big part of it. Obviously, you guys have heard me talk about having the economic equivalent of the backyard brawl where we're laying out. West Virginia's taxes, all of its taxes, and then comparing them to all the taxes in all the states that surround us. So you could look at it, look at the playing field economically, taxation, regulation, workforce rules, licensing rules, and say which state has the best policy. And then West Virginia gets to have the very best policy. You pick that. That's the kind of session that I'm looking forward to next year. So I'm not here to complain. I think that they always do some good things, and uh, they obviously have done some things over the past that have helped our state, but I'm excited about the future and what we can do because I still think West Virginia's uh, best days are in front of it, and I'm uh, looking forward to having that opportunity, and it'll just be a different type of dynamic. A uh, couple of thoughts uh, from you in regards to the recent State of the Union and President Joe Biden and some thoughts about the Biden administration and the EPA as it relates to West Virginia. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how many folks listening watched uh, Sleepy Joe, but he was amped up a little bit. He was um, definitely amped up. <laughs> and I think, look, I I, I think that he's had a very challenging presidency. Certainly it's not been positive for the state of West Virginia, uh, nor our country. And so, uh, you know, I, I think he was trying to make, make his points and once again in an election year. Uh, but I, I was not uh, overwhelmed by what he did. And uh, I thought that, you know, it, it just seems like everything these days is just all politics all the time. I used to remember, you know, back in the day when you'd have uh, people go before uh, the joint session of Congress. And if you're the president, 
it's got to rise a little bit above it. Obviously, there are always going to be your agenda items, your points that you're making, uh, but it's not just going to be raw politics. I just thought it was a lot more political than you're normally used to seeing. And so I, I'd be interested in seeing uh, whether that can change again into the future. Let's talk about the Environmental Protection Agency and this multi-state uh, fight that you've joined as well in regards to what you re- think uh, would be job-killing rules. Yeah, so as many people have heard me talk over the years about uh, various types of EPA regulations, the EPA seems to want to go further and further uh, to regulate where they lack the authority to do so. And um, in the most recent case, they're trying to regulate more aggressively on particulate matter and without boring people as to all the uh, the issues, this is really very relevant when manufacturers are applying uh, for permits in terms of the permissible emissions. And even though the United States has uh, probably the single best uh, and the most rigorous regulations across the, the globe, uh, the EPA wants to keep going further and further in a way that I think is inconsistent with the law. And the point that I always try to raise, and it's been successful, as we've argued in the courts, is every agency should act within its own authority. And when the EPA lacks the authority to act in an area, you have to push back and say no. And we have successfully stopped the EPA with the so-called Waters of the United States rule, uh, where they were trying to regulate your backyard ditch and your ephemeral stream, like the Mississippi, the Potomac, the Ohio. And then you have the carbon emissions uh, rule and broad aspects of the Green New Deal that we were able to uh, to block. And uh, that was important. And in each case, they're going well beyond their statutory authority. I think the same here in the most recent uh, challenge that uh, a lot of the manufacturers would be in a very difficult position uh, to compete around the globe if these regulations go through. Patrick, t- tell us how that works. And, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here listening to you. You're talking about the issue and thinking if I'm a manufacturer and the EPA lays out a rule, how long do I have to comply with that rule? But then your office steps in, along with other attorneys general uh, across the nation, to say, no, this is affecting us in a negative way and this shouldn't be. And now it, d- do I have to abide by that rule while you're trying to block it? How does that work? Yeah, so it's a great question, and uh, frequently what happens is that uh, the administration puts out rules even though they know that the rules lack the legal authority and that they might get tossed out, but they try to encourage companies to come into compliance with their proposal even though they're going to get struck down in court. And so that's disconcerting, of course, because that's not the way it's supposed to work. It's supposed to come up with a compliant rule Uh, So more and more frequently, we've gone into court and we file for injunctions because we try to stop these regs in their tracks. And we've had an increasing level of success getting these injunctions. That way, if there's an injunction in place, the company would not have to come into compliance right away. Uh, But if the court doesn't grant the injunction, then, of course, uh, the rule would be active and the company would have to be in compliance. Otherwise, they could pay penalties. So, for instance, when you're talking about the waters of the United States rule, if that's in effect, uh, an individual landowner might be subject to fines of up to 37500 bucks a day. And so it just depends upon the nature of the rule. Um, sometimes there's a fair amount of time given for compliance. Sometimes Virtually no time is given for compliance, and that could affect whether the court gives the injunction or not, right? If it's a really tight timeline and people really have no meaningful ability to get legal relief or to come into compliance, that uh, increases the urgency on the part of the court to grant uh, the stay because there would be imminent harm. So it all depends upon the nature of the regulation and the, uh, the court and the case. But uh, obviously, we've been fortunate, we've been very successful on a lot of these regs uh, over the years. 
What are uh, what are some other things, other examples of governmental overreach by the federal government that are affecting West Virginia adversely at this time that you guys are trying to go after? Yeah, in fact, it's a it's a generally a pretty long list. I think. One of the- <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> yes. It's, yeah, look, it's, it's a shame, right? Because it shouldn't be that we have to spend so much time pushing back against the federal government, but that we do. And you see that the Biden administration is trying to creep into every aspect of our lives. And so uh, I go back first to some of the COVID vaccine mandates. That was a really big deal for West Virginia, uh, because what we were able to do, we blocked a lot of the employer, the efforts to have employer based mandates here in West Virginia, uh, at least as issued by the state government. There were a couple that were thinking of doing that and pushing that. And I issued a legal opinion uh, that I think helped to block that. But then the federal government came along and they tried to assert they had police power over these companies to be able to uh, do a forced mandate. And they tried to do it uh, on employers. They tried to do it on government contractors. They tried to do it on health care. We ended up being part of coalitions that won every case against these mandates, COVID mandates, but one. The health care mandate, the Supreme Court ruled five to four the other way. But that mattered a lot. We probably ended up saving a lot of jobs. I talked to so many people who uh, really wanted us to stand strong uh, for that. That was a very big deal. So uh, there are other issues, too. We know that when it comes to some of the culture wars that the Biden administration has been engaging in, they've been trying to force all of these schools that get public funding Uh, to uh, mandate that men can play sports with women. And so they issued regulations to that effect. And uh, so we're in the process of fighting back on that uh, right now. And if the uh, Biden administration succeeds in that venture, then uh, schools in West Virginia might have to decide, am I going to take any federal money that's conditioned, that has strings attached to it, uh, or am I going to go in a different direction? So that can have a very... Uh, meaningful impact on uh, what's going on. So there are a lot of issues, whether we're talking about energy, whether we're talking about OSHA, whether we're talking about uh, mandates, whether we're talking about uh, funding issues uh, or clawbacks. I know that uh, many people may remember that uh, we won a really big clawback case against the federal government where they were trying to argue that uh, there was a provision in the American Recovery Act that limited the state's ability to cut taxes. And uh, we have a lot of expertise in that area. We went in and we were able to prevail. And a major reason why you have tax relief in West Virginia is because we were able to prevail in that lawsuit and take away the fear of a callback. If you're good about this stuff, you can sometimes proactively go into court and you can challenge these things and you can make sure you take away uh a potential liability uh, for your state. And that's what we did. And that's what allowed the uh, tax cuts, at least in part. There were other reasons, too, of course, but it certainly was an important part of how many West Virginians obtained tax relief. I hope about uh, two minutes left here, by the way. I was going to say, I hope that our, our next attorney general is just as much of an advocate protecting the rights of West Virginians and West Virginia businesses as you have been, sir. I want to say thank you to you for that, because every time well, you're, every, you're very kind. Well, so every, thank you. Every time we talk to you, you you talk about all the things that you are doing, all the suits, unfortunately, that you're having to have because of the governmental overreach of the current administration. But you and your your team are always just fighting for West Virginia. Well, thank the, you. The biggest effect, I think, was really the water rights for mm-hmm. the Potomac, because Maryland controlled those for so long, and you you don't have water rights, it's hard to expand economically. You can't feed businesses. Well, Rob, you know what? You know what was cool about that case is that that's the one case we didn't have to litigate. So this is wild. So I generally am a believer that you give people an opportunity to do the right thing before you sue them. Right? Seems to make sense. And so we had heard that Maryland was interpreting uh, their legal authority over the Potomac to really restrict the ability of folks on our side of the river in West Virginia to be able to access the Potomac. And remember when we had Procter & Gamble coming in, a lot of companies coming in, West Virginia wanted to make sure it had 
uh, adequate access to the Potomac. And so I started to look at this, and we wrote a letter to the state of Maryland, which was built on a case that Maryland had with Virginia many years before that. And we asserted that because West Virginia was derived from Virginia, that because of a compact that was in place between the two states going back hundreds of years, Maryland couldn't uh, just assert that they had this authority. And we wrote the letter to the Maryland attorney general. And to his credit, rather than forcing us to go to court, he wrote a letter back. And it was a huge, huge win. He wrote a letter back saying, nope, you're correct. And you, West Virginia does have access and they are not contesting it. And that's really big for the people of Jefferson County, Berkeley County, Morgan County, all the folks in that area. Obviously, we have to be good stewards of the environment to make sure that the resources are used properly. But that's up to our state uh, to make that decision. And I know that uh, it's much better that we get to make the call rather than someone on the other side of the river. All right. Final word is yours, Patrick. Anything else that you'd like to pass along? No, I just want to say thank you for giving me the opportunity to come in. And we're going to have some, some pretty big news coming up soon. Uh, I think positive news. We're hopeful on the opioid front. And uh, I think that'll be something that the, the whole state likes. And there'll be more opportunities, of course, uh, to push back on the terrible fentanyl that's flooding into our state. We didn't have a chance to talk about that today, but that remains one of the most vexing problems facing West Virginia. And we spend time every day looking to push back against that because we have too much senseless death. And uh, we've done a lot in that area. We're going to keep focusing on it uh, because this is a weapon of mass destruction and it needs to be treated as seriously as uh, times when we send our men and women overseas because it's slaughtering too many people. Patrick, thank you very much. Appreciate your time today. Hey, thanks, guys. Be well. Thank you. Attorney General Patrick Morrissey at 901.